Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Hope LNG Partners Q1 2020 conference call. All participants will be in a listen-only mode. Should you need assistance, please know a conference specialist by pressing the star key followed by zero. After today's presentation, there will be an opportunity to ask questions. To ask a question, you may press star and then one. To withdraw your questions, you may press star and two. Please also note today's event is being recorded. At this time, I'd like to turn the conference call over to Stefan Foride, CEO, CFO. Sir, please go ahead. Thank you, Jamie. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Hogan D Partners Birding Call for the first quarter of 2020. For your convenience, this webcast uh, and presentation are available on our website. Before we start, Please take a note of the forward-looking statement on uh, page two and a glossary on page three. Turning to page four and the highlights, I would like to start with some comments relating to the COVID-19 situation. As of today, the partnership and uh, the uh, Hergel and G Group are experiencing limiting impact from the COVID-19 pandemic. The group has taken steps to mitigate risk from the pandemic and uh, to ensure the health and safety of our crews and staff, which is our highest priority. We are continuously monitoring the situation and are as prepared as possible to address any changes to the situation that might impact us. As of today, the group has experienced no known cases of COVID-19 infection among any of our crews or staff. The only direct effect on its operation has been delays in crew changes, which have limited financial impact. However, this situation is improving, and the group has been able to conduct crew changes on several of its vessels in recent weeks, including one of the vessels for the partnership. Additional crew changes are being prepared for the week ahead. The technical availability of the group suite has not been affected by the current pandemic. All charter parties remain in full force and revenues are being collected in accordance with the contractual terms. Now, going to the financials, and thanks to the hard work of our crew and staff, I am happy to report that all units in the partnership fleet had 100% availability in the quarter. This resulted in total revenues of 36.7 million, segment EBITDA of 36.1 million, and a coverage ratio of 1.2 times in the quarter. The partnership distributed 44 cents per common unit for the quarter. Furthermore, during the quarter, the partnership exercised the option to charge the Hergaland to Hergaland G. The subsequent charter has now been signed with a five-year term expiring on July 31st, 2025. The charter rate is 90% of the previous charter rate for the unit. Turning to page five, we are putting more numbers to the quarter, which shows a stable underlying operating performance compared to the same quarter last year. Excluding unrealized losses on derivative instruments and foreign exchange, Segment EBITDA was 36.1 million for both the first quarter of 2020 and 2019. Limited partners interest in adjusted net income was 13.6 million in the quarter, up slightly from the first quarter of 2019. The improvement is mainly due to one more calendar day in the quarter due to the leap year, lower operating expenses and lower taxes, partly offset by higher net financial expense. I'm happy to report that despite the COVID-19 pandemic, the partnership delivered strong operating performance and a strong distribution coverage from our long-term contracts in the quarter. Turning to page six, we are showing the development of key measures over time. As you can see from these graphs, the consistency stands out 
underpinning the distribution made for the quarter. And with the execution of the five-year option relating to Her Galan, we have further ensured the long-term stability of the partnership cash flow. And with approximately 9.2 years of average remaining duration of our contract portfolio, the partnership is well positioned to continue providing predictable distribution. Turning to page seven, we are showing the income statement in more detail. Total revenues in the quarter is up from the same period last year, mainly due to the extra trading day in the quarter. Vessel operating expenses of 5.5 million in the quarter is down from the same period last year, mainly due to lower use of spare parts and external services in the quarter. Equity in losses of joint ventures of 10 million in the quarter compares to equity in earnings of 300,000 in the same quarter last year. Excluding unrealized losses on derivative instruments, the equity in earnings of joint ventures would have been 1.7 million in the quarter compared to 2.9 million for the same quarter last year. The decrease primarily relates to higher charter project costs in the quarter, the majority of which are expected to qualify for a reimbursement from the charter in future periods. Total, total financial expense of 6.9 million in the quarter is up from the same quarter last year, mainly due to a gain on debt in the first quarter last year. Interest expenses were down in the quarter compared to the same quarter last year. Taxes was 900,000 in the quarter, which is down in the same quarter last year, mainly due to a reduction of tax rate in Indonesia. Turning to page eight, the balance sheet has not changed much since the year 2019. The total liabilities and equity standing at just below 1 billion at the end of the quarter. One thing worth mentioning is that in addition to the cash on the balance sheet, the partnership had approximately 95 million in undrawn amounts under the two revolving credit facilities, taking total liquidity to approximately 123 million at the end of the quarter. Turning to page nine, we are shown the partnership assets all of which operated according to contract during the quarter, as already mentioned. In regards to Hökalan, the subsequent charter is now in force, as mentioned, with a term running through July 31st, 2025. The charter rate is 90% of the previous charter rate, subject to certain adjustments for avoided or incremental costs. As previously announced by Hökalan D, a parent has secured an interim time charter for Hökalan in LNG carry mode for a period of around seven months from mid-2020. And in addition, the unit is considered for several of the potential long-term SSOU projects that Hökalan D is working on, which I will come back to later in the presentation. In regards to Neptune and Cape Ann and the boiler flame, the settlement agreement has now been signed and the first installment has been made with the remaining to be paid later this year. The indemnification payment from Hergel and G relating to the first settlement installment has further been settled. Turning to page 10, uh, we are showing the overview of the business development activity at the uh, Hergel and G level. And I'm happy to report that this slide is becoming increasingly busy. During the quarter, Hergel and G was selected as the preferred bidder for two and short fixes for one additional FSIU project. The box to the left shows the projects where Hergel and G has the preferred bidder status. We have previously announced the two projects in Australia, but now there are two additional projects on the list, both located in Latin America, with a scheduled startup in the 2021 to 2023 timeframe. In terms of progress for the Australian project, AIE has now received approval for its application to modify the existing development content for Port Kembla Terminal. And for AGL's project in Crick Point, the environmental permit process is ongoing 
and expected to be completed by the end of the year. The box in the middle is showing ongoing tenders, and for one of them, Kurgalandji has been shortlisted during the quarter. Also, this located in Latin America. Finally, the box to the right is showing bilateral projects, a project that Hergelandji is developing itself. This includes a project on the European side of the Atlantic Basin being developed by Hergelandji and one potential project in Cyprus. This development of the business development side shows that the activity in the FSIU market is high. And the way we see it, this is driven by the low price of of LNG. This is triggering new LNG importers to move ahead with their plans to facilitate import of natural gas. And this high activity is ongoing despite the COVID-19 pandemic. Turning to page 11 and the LNG market, in the first quarter of 2020, the LNG market grew by 13%. Europe continues to be the main driver of growth. However, demand from Asia also remains strong, where India and South Korea were the main growth markets in the quarter. If you take India as an example, the import continues to increase, driven not only by the low price of LNG, but also by the country's need for a continued fuel switching to deal with the pollution. China was fairly impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic in the first quarter. However, it's now showing sign of coming back and increasing its LNG import. Turning to page 12, we have graphs illustrating the expected development in the global LNG market. If you look at the graph to the left, this shows the forecasted LNG demand both prior to and after the COVID-19 pandemic. And as you can see, demand growth is expected to continue despite the pandemic, but be less this year than estimated previously before picking up again in 2021, after which it is expected to be aligned with the prior forecast. Total demand is expected to be only marginally lower in the years ahead and reach approximately 430 million tons in 2024. The graph to the right shows where the reduced demand growth is expected to result in reduced supply growth. And as you can see from this graph, U.S. exporters are expected to see most of it. And why is that? Well, simply because most U.S. export agreements are flexible, allowing buyers to reduce the uptake. U.S. exports are not tied to a particular gas reservoir. It's sourced from the whole upstream market but it's easier for U.S. exporters to make adjustments. That is not the case elsewhere in the world, which is why we are expected to see this picture. Turning to page 14 uh, and the competitive situation, this picture looks more or less as presented over the last couple of years. We have not added any new billing orders since the previous quarter even though there has been reports of a new billing order by MOL. However, we understand that this is conditional and have therefore not included it in the list. However, we have included two conversion units in the captive market, one relating to a project in El Salvador and one for a project in Africa. However, for Hergen and G, this means that the comp competitive situation has not changed from the previous quarter in the market where we are. And with that, I would like to uh, turn to page uh, 60, uh, 14 and a summary and open up for questions from the audience. Ladies and gentlemen, at this time, if you would like to ask a question, please press star and then one using a touchtone telephone. To withdraw your questions, you may press star and two. If you are using a speakerphone, we do ask you please pick up the handset before pressing the numbers to ensure the best sound quality. Once again, that is star and then one to ask a question. Our first question today comes from Ben Nolan from Steeple. Please go ahead with your question. 
great. Thank you. Uh, and good morning, afternoon. Um, I, I had a few questions, but the first relate to uh, the commentary in the earnings release about the possibility or, or the need to refinance uh, uh, the lamp loan um, next year. Uh, just making sure that was more uh, that the the commentary in there was more of just an abundance of caution uh, rather than you know some foreseen challenge with respect to the need to refinance that vessel. Correct. It it should be relatively easy to refinance. Yes. Hi Ben. Um, yes, that has an uh, an um, that has a long term financing. Uh, involving um, ECAs from from South Korea and a commercial tranche on top of that, uh, and uh, the commercial tranche is is maturing uh, next year. It's uh, about 15 million dollars or so, uh, and uh, it has always been part of the plan to to refinance that in 2021. But the, the facility as such, including the ECA tranche, is is not up for refinancing. It's the commercial tranche of the facility. Okay, and and you wouldn't foresee any concern, or wouldn't have any concern over the ability to refinance that, correct? No, I, I don't. This is a, a vessel with a long-term contract with a strong counterparty that has been formed. Uh, so this is, uh, you know, this is uh, a good uh, coverage uh, contract coverage. Uh, for that vessel, so I see no problem with that. Okay, perfect. Uh, and then another thing I was going to ask that, that we've heard a little bit um, in this whole COVID environment, and given the challenges of uh, crew changes and so forth, that there may be a little uh, creep in the operating expenses as, as crews might be um, existing crews that have overstayed their their contracts might have to be paid a little bit more. Is that something that you might would expect in the in the second quarter, maybe the third quarter? Yeah, it's uh, we haven't really that, that's a risk. We haven't really seen that so far, uh, but uh, you know that that's a risk where you could have overlapping crews sitting. Um, but so far, that has not really been a, a problem, um, and we um, so I wouldn't see that as a material um, risk, but uh, potentially there could be some, some minor costs. Okay, perfect. Uh, and then and then lastly, just on a, from a macro perspective, uh, you, you in the in the latter slides there, you kind of walk through the the projects and also uh, the competitive landscape. And obviously, there has been a few uh, project awards for conversion vessels. Uh, although the you know for for you guys you have the purpose built vessels that that where you're I guess the stocking horse in several Latin American projects has there been any change or switch at all in the cadence between um, be, between the desire to maybe use a uh, a converted vessel maybe a little bit uh, cheaper lower in converted vessel versus something that uh, is purpose built with higher throughput and um, capacity. Any, any anything you've noticed there? No, I wouldn't say. I think there's room for both. I think what we see, as I said, that actually the activity in the business development side is is high, and we see that there is the more and more projects, you know, moving forward, uh, and that's projects both for new build and and uh, conversions. So I wouldn't say that there has been, you know. Uh, a shift in preference, but it's 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 a market where there's room for 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 both type of of FSIUs, which we have seen. Perfect. All right, great. I'll I'll turn it over. Thank you. Our next question comes from Chris Weatherby from City. Please go ahead with your question. Hey, hey great. Thanks for taking the question. Um, yeah, maybe a conceptual one here to a degree. So so lots of you know interesting activity that you highlight on on the. the slide 10, um, if we were to see some incremental uptake activity at the parent level, what would it take for um, maybe the resumption of, of drop-down activity into um, 
you know, your vehicle? What, what are sort of the circumstances that you would need to see um, to do that? Or, or is it something that could, could happen if you get a, a long-term contract signed with the parent that could happen sort of, you know, is there financing available? I, I guess I wanted to make sure I understood, you know, sort of the, the moving parts around kind of getting back into that type of direction for the company. Well, so the the parent has has assets that is available for the drop down, and they just need to secure the long term employment of them. And uh, this slide shows that there is high activity in you know serving uh, securing the long term employment, so that's good. Um, so that's kind of one trigger of of growth, uh, but. Another and another tr uh, element we need to see is then you know the financing of of such growth. Now, if you look at the the timing, I, most project we are working on, they have or the parent is working on has a startup of from, potential startup from end 21 through 2023. So, I, so I would say that <clears throat> the timing of when we could expect to see a drop down coming our way would be you know 2022. And and I think we will have to wait in, in considering the financing option at that point in time. Uh, we will have to see how the equity market is, both for the common and the preferred. And we will also see how much we have deleveraged by then, because we are deleveraging the, the partnership. And, and if the uh, equity market should not be available, then potentially there could be a room for, for leveraging up. But that's an assessment we will have to make that point in time. But anyway, the, the trigger point is is for the parent to secure the long term employment of its assets so that it has something to offer as well. Okay. And, and then financing would be the secondary kind of component that's that yeah. helpful. Um, on the topic of deleveraging, can you can you give us a sense of maybe what you feel like you can accomplish uh, through 2020? Um, and, and then maybe if we're if we're talking about potentially a 2022 timeline for the question that we we just talked about, what would be the the potential opportunity to deleverage over the course of the next two years? So say 2020 and 2020, 2021. So I think there it will be along the same uh, lines as we have done previously. Um, we have uh, now secured the long-term stability of, of cash flow from all it, our assets, including Höga Land. Uh, so uh, we will allocate you know, the cash flow to, to uh, debt repayment and, and dividend distributions. And we have in the past seen a steady you know, deleveraging and we expect that trend to be continuing through 2020 and, and 2021. When we then do a, a drop down, we, we should expect to see leverage increase slightly because there will, on a debt to EBTA basis, the debt that follows with the asset when it's being dropped down from the parent is, is probably going to be higher. Same debt amount um, as it has been the case in previous drop down, but probably lower EBTA follows that vessel, so it's a it's an increase in the in the leverage in terms of debt to EBITDA upon the drop down. Oh, okay, but just assuming that the the all the contracts perform um, as expected, how much cash flow above the distribution do you think you generate in 2020? So it, it's it's not going to change from for what we have seen in the past. It's going to be the same, uh, you know. Free cash flow that we can uh, cash flow that we can use for deleveraging purpose, as as we see on a on a quarter like 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 this quarter, and we have seen in the past. So there won't be any changes to that compared to what we have seen in the past. Okay, okay, that's very helpful. Thanks very much for the time. I appreciate it. Our next question comes from Ken Huckster from Bank of America Merrill Lynch. Please go ahead with your question. Hey, Stefan, I, I think um, – uh, good morning and good afternoon. Uh, maybe just to wrap up on that prior one, I think Chris was just looking. Can you give just a, a kind of, I don't know, a, a debt to EBITDA level or what, what that reduction in the free I, – I know you keep saying it's going to be the same, um, but just maybe an absolute number of what you're looking in terms of debt reduction in the year ahead. Hello. 
And ladies and gentlemen, the speaker line has dropped. Please remain patient while we attempt to reconnect. Mr. Foride, you can continue with the conference. We have Ken in the question queue. Yes, thank uh, you. I'm sorry for, for dropping out here. Something technically happened. Uh, back to the uh, question of, of deleverage. We have, uh, at the moment, the partnership has a, has a debt to EBTA of, on a proportionate basis of around uh, 4.2 times. And I think we could uh, expect to see uh, a deleveraging of around uh, 0.5 times, uh, you know, uh, on an annual basis based on, on the cash flow that we are generating around there. That's very helpful. That's great. Um, I still have an open line. You can hear me, right, Stephen? Yes, I can. Okay, wonderful. So thanks for that. Um, so just on the uh, on the, the gallon, I guess now I, I just want to understand with some of the new projects that you're talking about with Hogue, is there any incentive for them to – permanently place the gallant in those projects? Is, is that, um, or, or would they be looking solely at new build or conversion for those projects? Or, or could you look for a extension on, on the tie up of the, the gallant aside from just putting it to the parent? Uh, the, uh, the parent has, has is incentivized to make sure that uh, the partnership has long-term stability in its, its cash flows uh, and um, is uh, offering Högaland on several projects where that unit is best suited compared to, to is available and, and, and well suited. So when the parent then secures long-term employment to a third party for um, Högaland, the parent will benefit from that through getting off the hook themselves, and also through is stabilizing or securing the long-term cash flow for the partnership. So, so I think they are, you know, pursuing both alternatives and, and securing uh, assets or employment for new assets and for Bergalant in parallel. And then I guess maybe just to follow up on that, right, in the charter, in, in the release, you talk about the outlook um, mentions 90% of the rate payable subject to adjustments for avoided or incremental costs, which can reduce revenues. Is, is there anything you can quantify there, or is that just outside of the realm than the parent covers, but you're still – I just want to understand what the exposure is by that that, that kind of sentence. No, it's um, – <clears throat> the, the formula is that uh, when we then enter into um, – new long-term FSIU contract to the extent that the sum of operating expenses and uh, taxes relating to such contract exceeds 22000 per day, uh, that will result in an increase in the day rate that the parent uh, is, is paying us. Uh, during the period of time when the unit is operating in carrier mode, it will save taxes that it previously had in in uh, Egypt, equivalent to approximately 4,000 a day, 
and that will then reduce lead to a reduced higher for 4,000 during the period of time when the vessel is operating in area mode. So that's the the uh, the limit here, um, 4,000 for carry mode, and then actually as long as total costs exceed 22,000 in FSIU mode, it will lead to an increase in the day rate. And and just to uh, confirm there, you you said um, that the cat the the parent is incentivized uh, for for long term stability, nothing other than just the stability of the of HMLP. Is there other incentivization that they have in in guaranteeing your your stability, other than the dividends they receive and and the continuation of that? No, they have uh, the dividend and, and the ITRs and uh, the stability of, of the partnership's cash flow. That's their incentive for for, um, for securing the employment. Okay. Hey, Stefan, great. I appreciate it. Congrats on the stability and, uh, and good luck. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question comes from Liam Burke from B. Riley FBR. Please go ahead with your question. Thank you. Good afternoon, Stefan. Good afternoon, Leon. Uh, uh, Stefan, you mentioned um, in the uh, pr in these press release uh, just general um, risk in terms of uh, the ability of the counterparties uh, to be able to deliver. Uh, is this COVID-19 related, or is this just a general caution about the overall uh, FSRU market for the time being? Yeah, I think it's a, it's a general statement we have had for for some time. Um, we have, um, in relation to the COVID-19, uh, all our assets have been performed according to contract, and all our clients have been, you know, delivering their uh, obligations, and there has been no uh, discussions around uh, any change to the time chart. So, so we see that our clients have you know performed uh, their obligations so we don't see any necessarily any material increased risk associated to the counterparty uh, but uh, it's a, it's a general statement that we we make in our in our documentation okay and uh, on the operating expense side um, I know it wasn't a material change but you did have lower year-over-year -year expenses uh, I know you highlighted the potential of COVID-19 increasing them but uh, what uh, what kept expenses so low in the first quarter so we had some uh, we had lower spare parts and and external service external services and that were the two main components of driving the reduction Thank you, Stephen. It's correct. We have compared to the same quarter last year, we did see, in fact, a reduction in, in operating expenses, which is good. Thank you. Once again, if you would like to ask a question, please press star and then one. Our next question comes from Craig Hanna from Palm Beach Capital. Please go ahead with your question. Oh, hey, Stefan. Uh, looks like a really good job in a very difficult environment. Um, looking at uh, your cash flows, uh, I see that you've had your really only negative that I could find in the whole financials was this uh, unrealized loss on derivatives. Is there anything else that, you know, uh, you can tell us that might negatively impact uh, cash flows and your ability to you know, continue to pay this steady dividend uh, for the next couple of quarters or so that, you know, maybe not jumping out at us. Yeah, this is this correct. This this quarter was uh, was a good quarter. It's, it's, you know, good operating performance and, and no extraordinary items. So in many ways, it was a very good quarter. Uh, I, I think we have, uh, you know, highlighted uh, the, the main risk as, as we see them, uh, and um, uh, in terms of, of you know uh, the counterparty risks and uh, and impact from COVID-19. So far, we we have not been materially impacted by COVID-19, but the situation is is unfair and it 
can move uh, change quickly. We are, um, you know, we are doing as much as we can to prepare for, you know, adverse development and, and implement measures to mitigate that. But I, I think COVID-19 is a, a situation that is difficult for everyone, and, and we are putting a lot of, you know, time and resource in in mitigating the risk associated with that. So I think maybe that's the biggest, uh, you know, risk element uh, in the quarters ahead, uh, where we don't really know what the consequence of the pandemic, uh, how that will play out. Mm -hmm. And um, so it looks like, you know, other than this unrealized loss on derivatives, everything's pretty much the same. It just continues to go. You've got these nine-year uh, contracts. Uh, so uh, it, it looks like a very steady business uh, to, you know, stay invested in and to continue to grow the investment. Uh, I'm looking at, you know, your opportunities in Australia and, and uh, Asia, uh, which sounds like, you know, obviously everything takes a long time, but that's, uh, that looks pretty exciting. What's going on, um, you know, in Europe? You said that, uh, you know, that, that business is going quite well, too. Are there some good growth opportunities there? Uh, we see that, you know, Europe has been a, a growth market for LNG, uh, and uh, they have actually been, you know, driving much of the demand uh, of the last 12 months. And that's very interesting. Europe has previously uh, taken the, and most of it, oh, is taking most of its gas from, from pipeline. But the fact that the LNG is going to, to Europe is, is interesting. So I think um, that is, uh, there's a lot of opportunities that follows that, uh, where there might be needed more in, uh, points for importing LNG. So, so Europe is an it has is offering some opportunities. We mentioned uh, this project in uh, Cyprus, and we also have one bilateral project that we are working on um, on the European side of uh, where we are looking at bilaterally uh, developing a project. So you know, Europe is it's a place where there are some opportunities uh, available in in the years ahead. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Stefan. Great job. Once again, if you would like to ask a question, please press star and one. And ladies and gentlemen, at this time and showing no additional questions, I'd like to turn the conference call over for any closing remarks. Okay, thank you. Uh, I would just like to thank everyone for, for dialing in and listening and for asking questions. Uh, and uh, thank you for, for the session today. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, with that, we'll conclude today's conference call. We do thank you for attending. You may now disconnect your line.